Good evening and welcome once again to Wednesday Night Bible Study. But if you look around, you'll see this is a totally different venue. And I would like to thank George and Deborah for allowing us to use their house tonight and probably next week as well. While my house is in a wreck. That's the only way I know to put it. But I thank you, George and Deborah, for letting us be here. It's good to be with you. And tonight we are going to finish Easter. Easter has gone on now for four weeks and the story needs to go all year long. But tonight we're going to finish up Easter. And I'm going to make a statement that I think every one of you will agree with. And then we're going to flesh it out. And that statement is God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Everybody involved in the story knew that he was dead, from the governor or the politicians there in Jerusalem to those soldiers that executed him, to the women who buried him, and then also to the enemies of Jesus who feared a conspiracy of a resurrection rumor. They certainly didn't want that, but they, everyone knew that he was dead. And that's why the lie that they concocted to explain the empty tomb was not that he wasn't really dead, but what they said was that the disciples had stolen his body. But you know what? That lie just didn't work because people don't risk their lives for a lie that they made up. The body was not in the tomb. Otherwise, the enemies would have laid it out for everyone to see, and that would have been the end of any thoughts of Christ being holy, divine, anything. So the disciples at this point also were just on fire with boldness, risking their lives by preaching that Jesus was alive. The evangelist Stephen and the apostle James had already lost their lives, and for 40 days, Jesus was appearing to individuals and to groups, some of those groups as large as 500 people. And most of those folks weren't terribly gullible, but some of them were very hard to convince that Jesus was alive. So as the possibility dawned on those skeptical disciples that the resurrection was true, the first speculation was that they saw Jesus and what they saw was a ghost of some kind. But Jesus quickly put an end to this speculation. He said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And before the stunned disciples do anything else on another occasion, Jesus insisted on eating fish to show them that he was not a ghost. See my hands and my feet, he said, that it is I myself. Touch me, touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And while they still disbelieved, they were with joy and they were marveling. And he said to them, have you got anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it before them and they saw that he was not a spirit, that he was not a ghost, that he was able to eat. But Jesus' resurrection body was so much more than a merely resuscitated mortal body. It was the same and yet it wasn't the same. He could be recognized as the one he had always been and his body was a physical body but it was also a changed, a transformed body. When the Apostle Paul described the future resurrection of Christians, you and me, he was describing the resurrection body that Jesus had because Christ was raised as, you'll remember these words, the first fruits of the rest of the dead who belong to him. In other words, the body of the risen Christ is part of that same harvest of all other bodies, you and me, that he will raise in glory at the last day. Christ, Paul says, will transform our holy body to be like his glorious self. So this description of our future resurrection bodies 
applies just as well to Jesus' body. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. It is the same body, and yet it's gloriously, gloriously superior to that body that once was only an earthly body. Tremendous divine power preceded and accompanied and followed the resurrection of Christ. Leading up to his resurrection, Jesus was totally in charge of his living and of his dying. His words, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord to take it up again. Jesus laughed at threats that he could be brought to death and before his hour, much less, could he be held in the tomb against his will. When he was warned that Herod wanted to kill him, remember what Jesus said? Go and tell that old fox, behold, I cast out demons and I perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I will finish my course. He predicted the details of his death and resurrection as one who was following his own unstoppable plan or his own agenda Jesus said to them, the scripture says, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. In the very act of resurrection, divine power held complete sway. Paul referred to the working of God's great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And Peter said, it was not possible for him to be held by death's power. Coming through death with sovereign power, Jesus entered into an imperishable, eternal, never-ending life. Jesus has become an ever-living high priest according to the power of an indestructible life. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die, Paul says in the book of Romans. No longer death has dominion over him. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. God raised him from the dead, and God gave him glory. Before, during, and afterwards, the resurrection of Jesus was a glorious manifestation, manifestation of Jesus and God's divine power. So, the resurrection of Jesus assures all of us his future work on behalf of his people. It assures us of his authority and rule over everything there is in this universe. It assures us of his priestly intercession on our behalf. We're assured of his protecting, comforting presence that will be with us until the end of the age. And his final coming to earth is assured in glory to give rest to us, but also to give retribution to all those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the resurrection of Jesus secures all the blessings that he obtained for us in his death. The resurrection proves the sufficiency of the cross, and it seals the certainty of our justification by our faith in Jesus. Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses, says Paul, and raised for our justification. All the promises, every promise of God, has become ours in everlasting perpetuity because of the resurrection of Jesus. Forgiveness, for example, if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile, says Paul, and you are still in your sins. But he has been raised, and so forgiveness is real and permanent. He always lives to make intercession for us. In the end, in the end, the risen Christ will raise us up with him. 
If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Paul got it. Paul knew how to put it into words and assure people. And he goes on to say here in Romans, if we have been united with him in a death such as his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. He makes this promise for all who believe. I will raise him up on the last day we find in the book of John. So his resurrection guarantees ours. Our resurrection is secure in glory just as he is. Luke says in his gospel, they cannot die anymore being sons of the resurrection. Over such the second death we read in the book of Revelation, the second death has no power. The glory of Christ in the power of his resurrection turns into an invincible life and omnipotent authority and will be reflected back to him in the joyful worship of his risen and perfected saints. That's us. I like that term, perfected saints. Who shall enjoy this eternal gift of life? And Jesus gives this answer. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall never die. So like every historical fact, the resurrection of Jesus can be and has been doubted. But when God takes in hand the reliability of the witnesses and the courage of their preaching, when God takes in hand the futility of the opposition and the effects of the gospel, and the coherence of the message and the all-embracing sufficiency of the Christian worldview when he takes in hand the spiritual glory of Jesus Christ. When God takes every bit of this and even more in hand, he is able to open the mind of the most resistant skeptic. There are people, you remember that term we read in the Bible, stiff-necked, that are stubborn, that are obstreperous. They are stiff-necked, but God can overrule that with his power and with his wisdom and all that he commands. When God wakens us from the stupor of disbelief and shines into our mind with what Paul calls the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, what we see along with the terrible agony of the crucifixion and the suffering he endured, what we see is the total grandeur of his resurrection. That's what Easter is all about. We come a long way through Lent, and we have to go through the passion of Good Friday, Maundy Thursday. And we have to get the whole story, but the grandeur and the promise is in the resurrection because it's in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we, those who believe in him, have gained eternal life. We haven't done anything to earn it. It's a total gift freely given. All we have to do is have faith and believe in him. It's been good to be with you tonight. It's been a good Easter. I've enjoyed going through Lent and through Easter. I hope you will take this with you, and Easter lasts all year long. Let us live Easter. Be safe, my friends. Wear your mask. I'll see you Sunday. Bye now.